You're listening to the Globetrotters podcast, the show dedicated to bringing you fresh and diverse perspectives from traveling enthusiasts all over the world. Here at the Globetrotters podcast, we hope to show that travel is so much more than how it's represented on social media and television by bringing you real stories and thoughtful discussions on ethical issues and investigations into how you can make the most of an adventure without breaking the bank. I'm your co-host, John Otero. And I'm Saskia Hatvani. Our last episode was The Layover, the monthly show where John and I delve into the latest travel headlines, give practical travel tips, and every once in a while, we'll investigate a questionable social media trend, and that's my personal favorite thing to do. A couple of episodes ago, we also interviewed Danielle Seat. She did a semester at sea. If you've never heard of that before, well, I hadn't either, but it's amazing, and it's actually open to pretty much anyone who wants to do it in the world. So go check out that episode if you're intrigued. I definitely was. But on today's episode, we're going to talk about scuba diving. And for those that don't know, and in fact, I'm not sure if you know, Saskia, what does scuba stand for? Oh, no, he's putting me on the spot. (laughs) Go ahead, John. SCUBA is actually an acronym that stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. And today, we have an experienced scuba diver who has done nearly 200 dives in the last 10 years and started at the young age of 49. And I don't mean that sarcastically. But before we dive into her story and pick her brain, a little background about our guest, Laura DeSisto. She is a freelance writer and author from Massachusetts who recently completed her memoir, Resurfacing, Sisterhood, Sharks, and Storms, which details her journey from depressed, empty nester to badass, which is true, middle-aged scuba diver who frequently dives with sharks on purpose. Laura, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Good, good. I'm happy to hear Laura, we will talk about your book, but before we we start talking about what got you interested in diving and sharks, bring us back to the beginning of your first experience. Why did you do it? I had always loved the sea and, in fact, learned how to swim in the ocean. Being from Massachusetts, you know, anybody who grows up near Cape Cod, especially in my generation, even in the cold water and the, and the seaweed and the dark water, our parents just kind of pushed us right right into the sea. So I had a very early love affair with the ocean, learned how to swim early and well. Unfortunately, that all changed when Jaws, the movie came out. I saw it in theaters the first week that it came out. And for my generation, I was not just me, so many of us just refused to go back in the water after that movie. It just seemed so real For me, especially having grown up in the area where it was filmed, my father was an avid sailor and we, every summer we went to the vineyard and, you know, we would, we would take the boat there and stay there for several weeks. And then my sisters and I would go off on our bikes and, you know, basically the movie was, as you know, was filmed there. And so many of the landmarks were places that we were familiar with. So it just felt a little too personal and So that's kind of the background. And I actually had always wanted to dive because Jacques Cousteau was a a huge show back when I was a kid and I I was an avid watcher of it and always, you know, I'd go to sleep at night and dream of, of scuba diving basically. And it wasn't until, as you point out, I was in my forties. I had a very, have a very good friend who's featured in the book who was already an avid scuba diver. And she encouraged me to go on this trip to the Bahamas And off we went. You know, if you read the book, you'll see that I got hooked right away, despite having an immediate encounter with a shark. Let's give Buffy her due credit, because let's call her by her name. She is the person that got you into scuba diving. So let's give her a little shout out. Yeah, I'm so glad you bring up this movie Jaws, because I wouldn't be surprised if that movie had inspired, you know, many more fears of the ocean. I mean, I think already being in the ocean or in a body of water of any kind where you can't see what's at the bottom is unnatural for us as humans and like fearful for us. So on top of that, now having a movie or many movies that sort of, you know, play into this fear, I think a lot of people would relate to that. And there's a lot of myths and you know, distorted facts when it comes to sharks. Before I kind of give a few of those that are noteworthy, I know that you're in, in the book, you talk about your first ever diving experience. You went on a exploratory dive in the Bahamas and you had your first encounter with a shark. 
and you didn't know that they were supposed to be there. So what was that like as a first time diver having an encounter with a shark? Well, it was terrifying initially, <laughs> and then it kind of quickly transformed to, you know, wonder and amazement about this incredible animal. I mean, when you see them underwater up close and you see them in their natural environment, there's nothing that can really accurately describe the experience, just the power and the the sleekness and the beauty of the animal. And quickly understanding that it had no desire to bite me or, you know, attack any of us. I think, you know, as has been noted by many marine biologists, almost always if a shark bites you, it's a case of mistaken identity. You're probably in dark water, you're probably on the surface, you know, it thinks you're prey. You're splashing around like an like an injured fish. And it's unfortunate, but a lot of times they'll take a bite and swim away because they don't like the taste of anything but fish. In fact, I spoke with shark feeders in Nassau, Bahamas, and one day they couldn't get fish for some reason. And so they thought, well, we'll just, we'll just go get a chicken and we'll, we'll get like a live chicken and we'll cut it up. And so there'll be blood and they could not attract the sharks. The sharks would not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I spent a lot of time diving in Thailand and it became a mission of mine eventually when I got comfortable to see a shark, I never got to see one. And so it's kind of like, it's interesting how once you do it, you do it a bit more, you realize it's actually a real gift to see a shark, right? Yes. In fact, we, at this point, my husband dives as well, and now my youngest son, if we have a dive where we don't see a shark, we're really disappointed. You know, we're we're (laughs) on the hunt for them all the time. Now, that's not to say- Metaphorically speaking. Yeah, right. That's not to say that there aren't dangerous sharks that you'd be foolish to dive with without trained professionals or really knowing what you're doing. You know, tiger sharks are one species that has evolved to basically eat anything in their path. And the reason is, is because they're much bigger and slower than their competitors. So we've now twice done this tiger feeding shark in the Bahamas. It's one of the, yeah, it's one of the few places in the world that you can do this. And on one occasion, this dive company had decided that they were really getting sick of the other shark species being at the bottom, competing with the tiger sharks for food. And so they had the idea that they would chum at the surface and bring the smaller sharks up. So there were, I mean, I'm guessing a hundred, you know, lemon sharks and reef sharks, you know, then we, we, after they were on the surface and still feeding them, we went down to dive with the tiger sharks and you just have to be really careful with them because they'll, you know, if, if they catch one and they autopsy it, they'll find the craziest things inside. They'll find, you know, license plates and, you know, they'll eat anything because they have to, they really don't have a choice. They're, they're hungry and they're slow and they've evolved to eat whatever. So. With that being said, I think you've scared off most of our listeners (laughs) who are probably listening to this, uh, including myself, and I've seen a few sharks. But, you know, to put this into perspective, according to the International Shark Attack File, which is a real thing, it's an organization (laughs) formed by the Florida Museum of Natural History that documents shark attacks worldwide. And in 2022, there were 108 shark attacks worldwide, 57 were unprovoked. 32 of them were provoked, and the rest fall under the category of boat bites, air sea disaster, etc. And when you talk about shark attacks, does this include like all water activities? We're not just talking about scuba diving, right? So how many actually have occurred scuba diving? That I'd be curious about. And I don't have the stats on that, Saskia, because some of them are very general, or it could be that you're surfing, so these don't relate specifically to scuba diving. But just to put everyone's mind at ease, you're more likely to be struck by lightning or killed in a car (laughs) accident than attacked by a shark. Mm. I think I also read that you're more likely to be killed by a vending machine tipping over. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. More common death than you might think. <laughs> or yes. hit by a coconut on the head. That's yeah, actually yeah. a very common death. <laughs> very so, common. So Laura, no, it is it is pretty common. Let me just circle back to the tiger sharks because I, I don't I don't want to scare your listeners. And first of all, you pretty much have to go to an area where you know there's tiger sharks to see a tiger shark. For example, there are really no tiger sharks in New England. There are great whites now, recently. 
but there's lots of places to dive in the world that you would never see a tiger shark. So you really shouldn't be afraid of tiger sharks unless, you know, and afraid isn't even the right word. It's, it's more like cautious and educated about them and how to fend them off. Because they are, it's, it's not hard to fend them off. They, they don't want to have a confrontation. You know, you can put your hand on their nose. You can push their head down and they'll go away. The most effective thing is to just face them head on and have them see you looking at in their eyes. They've evolved to understand that, you know, that means you too could be a predator or aggressive. So the thing you don't want to do is turn your back on them. Right. And do you actually know anyone who has been or have you heard of underwater attacks? Because I feel like when I hear about attacks, it's usually surfers. Getting back to your, John, your provoked attack things, I believe that that includes people who are spearfishing. Yes. Mm. Yes, it is. Yes. So people scuba dive and spearfish and, you know, you're taking your chances. You're you're going after their food and you're causing this smaller fish to struggle underwater and bleed. And so when sharks get very height, their senses get heightened and they go into a feeding frenzy. It's like you're looking at a different animal. I've observed it. My husband and I had the opportunity to trail people who were scuba diving and spear fishing from a safe distance. We asked if we could do it. And it was really cool to watch the shark's behavior because their pectoral fins go down, their body language changes. They, they, they swim much faster. They're in the, you know, predatory mode. So I personally wouldn't feel safe doing it. I think it's a really risky activity. I don't know why people do it. In shark infested waters. <laughs> I've been interested in it for a while, just a side note, but mostly for the sustainability aspect and the sort of like, you know, if you're going to eat fish, you might as well catch it yourself. You bring up a good point that in shark infested waters is probably not a good idea. No. <laughs> yeah. No. So I would say that that, you know, I have heard of attacks. It's mostly been that. There have been, I think, two deaths, this tiger feeding, you know, tiger shark feeding dive that we went on. And at least one of them was someone who didn't follow directions of the of the dive company. And another one, unfortunately, he was the last one to surface and they they never found him. So and they but they found his Mm -hmm. shredded equipment. So you know, you can edit this part out if you want, but yeah. no. it's not, a, nothing is risk-free, right? Driving a car isn't risk-free. And I know in one of our pre-podcast recording uh, discussions, I talked to you about how even experienced scuba dive professionals can make silly mistakes that put them in harm's way. For example, I gave you this uh, story about how this advanced scuba diver who had done dozens of dives had just forgotten to turn on her oxygen tank valve all the way. So when she actually dove, she couldn't breathe out of her respirator and needed to use someone's second piece to to kind of correct the issue. And luckily, one of the dive instructors immediately knew what was happening. So he just opened up her valve and she was able to breathe regularly. But, you know, there are a lot of other mistakes that I would worry about before, you know, a shark attack. Mm -hmm, 100%. Let's uh, shift the conversation a little to sort of the other side of this. I think when I talk about scuba diving with people, most of the time, most people I talk with have never done it. Most of them would never consider doing it. And I think there's a lot of fear associated, not just with the sharks like we were talking about, but namely decompression sickness. This is one I hear about a lot. And so I kind of want to address this with you quickly For those who don't know what decompression sickness is, it's also called the bends. To give a really basic explanation, it's when you rise from depth too quickly and your body doesn't have time to adjust to the pressure change, which can cause sort of all sorts of issues like bubbles of nitrogen forming in your blood, and it can be serious. It can kill you. But in reality, if I'm not mistaken here, most people who will dive recreationally will probably not be considered at risk. So I'd love to hear what you think about this and how dangerous is it really for the average scuba diver? There's so many different factors. You know, the rule of thumb is you can fly and then dive, but you can't dive and then fly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one thing is, you know, not getting in an airplane too soon after you dive. I want to say it's, I think 
maybe 48 hours. We, we would mm-hmm. never dive and then fly the next day. It's just too dangerous. I mean, I think if you s- stay within your limits and you, you know, you have to do that three minute safety stop. So some people won't, yeah. some people will, you know, dive at 60 feet and not even do a safety stop, but, um, wow, really? You, yeah. But you are, you are trained, you know, you know, if you do patty training, that's what we did. It's a big part of the training is, is to do a safety stop. So, so that helps a lot because at that depth, your, your blood is, your bloodstream is, they call it fizzing off. You're fizzing off the, I think, I think, like you said, it's nitrogen that collects in your bloodstream. So, but you know, there have been cases where people have done everything right and they still get it and they don't, they never figure out why. So it is a risk you're assuming there is insurance you can buy that will take care of airlifting you and finding the nearest decompression chamber. And we always buy it. It's not expensive. I did read about that, how some people can react differently and it's quite rare, but you'll never know until you try and that it's been recorded at shallow depths as well. But I would say that by and large in in my training, I think on the PADI website, it says that it should be considered standard to do a stop for all dives below 33 feet or that's below 10 meters. Which in reality, I think when I was doing my patty, that's where we stayed, if not shallower a lot of the time. However, they always did a safety stop just to, you know, to condition people to do it no matter what, because it's better to be safe than sorry. And, you know, it's just recommended. But like you said, I've also heard that, you know, you can dive up to 60 feet and not really risk a safety stop. I mean, there's all kinds of different I want to say opinions about this and maybe because of that ambiguity you talk about where you never really know, essentially. Yeah, they so they I, I'm probably going to mess this up because I, I don't, you know, it's been a while <laughs> since I've read this. But I believe that the way they figured all this out was through, you know, military, the military, like yeah, the that's Navy correct. divers. And, you know, these poor guys were guinea pigs. They were just like writing everything down. Well, I, you know, I was down for half an hour at 60 feet and uh you know whatever I was fine and then the poor next guy has to be down for two hours and gets the bends I mean yeah but but that's you know that's like the general parameters but for every person it's different I've heard that if you you know drink a lot of alcohol the night before you, you can have a factor I I imagine certain health conditions so Yeah, definitely. And then also it's a measure of time. When I was looking it up, it's like if you dive at 10 meters, then you can spend a lot more time there with a low risk. You would technically need to decompress after like a couple of hours. But then if you go to 40 meters, then you could only spend like nine minutes down there before you need a decompression exactly. stop. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it, it really is a, is a measure of time. And generally speaking, Regular scuba dives don't last more than 40 minutes to an hour, especially if you're in a group. You know, it all depends on how quickly you use up the air and they'll go up quicker. So I just wanted to bring this up to sort of say that it's, I don't know that it's as big of a a risk as people make it out to be, unless you're diving at extreme depths. Agree with you only from my own anecdotal experience in the sense that I'm not looking at the statistics, but we've met all these people and I've only met, I think, two that ever had it. So Mm. I think a very underrated factor of what your experience is like or could be is also the people that you surround yourselves with, uh, namely the company that you choose to go out with. And so, Laura, for your first time going diving now that you've you know, gone with so many different tour companies. Buffy recommended one in, in the Bahamas. And why did you go with that specific company? What were you looking at? Or what kind of research were you doing before you chose them? So I didn't research it at all because Buffy had been there so many times, but she had been t- with other dive operations that she felt were not as scrupulous and safe. And so she was really insistent that for my first time diving, I go to a five-star patty dive shop. And, you know, patty is, I guess, pretty strict. I, I don't know a lot about this, but I know that if you, ha- if, if there's an incident at a dive shop, it gets very, very well investigated and they can lose their rating. You know, I personally wouldn't take my chances with a place that wasn't highly rated. I think I mentioned in our pre-interview that 
I think one really good thing is to is to connect with the scuba diving community to go on Facebook. There's so many different groups you can join. And if you type in a question, it's amazing, like how quickly people respond, like, hey, I want to go to Thailand. Can you recommend a safe shop? You'll get a million answers and good answers. It's a, it's a really great community. I want to bring up just quickly, because we keep mentioning PADI. I don't think we've actually explained what that is. It's P-A-D-I, the Professional Association of Diving Instructors. And it's kind of a gold standard. Dive shops will be certified PADI dive shops. And then you can know that they're being held to this international standard. So, you know, the PADI open water course is one of the more famous ones. And that's the introductory level course to be certified in diving. And of course... I think there is another system of international diving regulation, but this is the most common one as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and there's several, actually. I researched this before our interview, and there's seven that are reputable. But the reason that PADI tends to be the most, I guess, like chosen certification center organization is because well, they're world-renowned, right? They have more than 6,600 PADI dive centers and resorts worldwide. And I think I read this statistic that 65 to 70% of all individuals that are certified each year register through PADI. I'd love to shift the conversation to like a more positive note. <laughs> and what's so great about diving, all of us on this call have done it before, and I think all of us are fans. But I'd love to hear from you. If someone's on the fence about diving for the first time or worried about it or maybe considering it, how would you convince them? For me, it's the, first of all, it's the feeling of weightlessness that I love. It's like flying once you are trained and you have achieved new, what they call neutral buoyancy, which you guys know what that is, where you're not having to inflate your BCD too much. You're not having to kick so much or deflate. And you're just essentially like, you could be anywhere in the water and just be level. That to me was just the coolest feeling when I finally achieved that. So that was one big thing. And then of course the sea life. I mean, it's like being on the moon. You're in a whole different world. So much of the ocean, as you know, is still unexplored. So that's, you know, that's really cool too. Certainly sharks are a huge draw for me. I love them. I love all kinds of sea life. I, you know, we've been diving with lots of different kinds of rays and mm. that, you know, that's incredible. So I would just say if you've, if you've always wanted to do it and you love the water, if you go to a, a five-star rated patty shop and you do this discover scuba course, which you can do in a day, you're, you're most likely going to be safe. You know, you're going to be surrounded by really good dive masters, maybe even a dive instructor, which is such a, you know, a high level. They, they're going to take very good care of you. And you may like me just discover this new found passion that may just reignite your whole life, which is kind of what happened with me. So I, I can't re recommend it enough. Having said that, I have a few friends that I've really tried to, you know, encourage and both of them went down about 10 feet and felt claustrophobic and came right back up. So I think you, you'll you mm. know pretty quickly if it's not for you. And just as a quick follow-up question to that, we are a travel podcast and you mentioned that you live on the East Coast. So naturally you could go scuba diving in Massachusetts if you really wanted to. You'd need a really thick wetsuit to do it, mm -hmm. but it's possible. Why are you traveling to these locations? I know you've done Bahamas, Mexico. Why are you traveling to scuba dive? Well, there's certainly a lot more to see in those locations. Number one, I'm not in then number two, I'm not a fan of cold water. That's the other thing too, like if you've never been in super clear water and you scuba dive and you're able to see, you know, a hundred feet visibility and it's just, it's magical. It's like being in a fish tank or, a, you know, aquarium. It's just amazing. So that would be the reason why. And, you know, the other thing too, I'll say is that one of the coolest things is having something to center your travel on right? Mm. Like some people yeah. are foodies and they, they go all over the world in search of whatever different cuisine or, you know, the finest chefs. What's really cool is once you get hooked on diving, you start to research it. Maybe you're reading a magazine and you see some species that you want to travel with or that you want to dive with. And you realize, okay, well, in order to do that, I have to go here. It's a great way to organize your travel. 
I'm finding myself every time I go somewhere near water, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if they have a, a diving, right. uh, you know, a diving center near here. And, you know, sometimes it's in the most unlikely places too. Like I didn't actually get to dive in this place, but at Lake NC in France, hmm. which is just a big, beautiful Alpine lake, turns out they have a, a dive shop there and you could dive this beautiful lake. And also I'll add to that, the lure of getting trained for your PADI training certificate is that once you have that, then actually diving in other centers around the world is not so expensive because if you pay for the individual dive, I think if if I'm not mistaken, in some areas you can also just rent the equipment if you have a certified dive buddy mm -hmm. and go the two of you and you don't need to hire the instructor for the day. So that's also the the thing is it becomes less expensive the more experienced you are. Yes. Yeah. And we have done that. We try to do it in places that are very safe. So, you know, we know we're not going to get in trouble, but that is a really cool thing to do. I agree. I think we would be punished by our listeners if we didn't ask the question, what has been your favorite diving experience? So funny. I was just talking about that last night with someone. And oh, I'd say it's a tie between the Manta Ray dive on the west coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. I think every diver should do that. It's a bucket list item for so many divers. It's it's a night dive. The, the Manta Rays are there every night and they're attracted by the lights, I, I guess initially, I think it was near like the Sheridan Hotel. They couldn't figure out why the manta rays all of a sudden were appearing in this area. And they figured out it's because the lights from the Sheridan Hotel attracted the plankton. Oh, and that's okay. what the manta rays eat. Oh, wow. Now these dive companies go down almost every night and they bring these underwater torches and they go down and plant the torches and then they signal it's time to go in and they give everyone a, you know, a flashlight, underwater flashlight. You go down and there's this like circle of like big rocks that they've planted. It's almost like a campfire. It's so cool. And the, the, the guests, I would be considered a guest. You go behind one of the big rocks, you can hold on to it. And then the manta rays come in and they do these back rolls, getting the plankton Incredible. and they're lit up by these lights. I mean, it was just amazing. Mm. So there was it's that. like a performance. Yes. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. It's amazing. That's amazing. You can Google it and you'll see videos. And then the other one, was in the Sea of Cortez, we did a dive with sea lions. And there's a certain time of year, like the pups are born. It must be like... You are brave. Yeah, it must I'm be scared like of early, sea lions. Oh, no. It must be like early fall, I'm guessing. And apparently there's this, there's this slice of time where it's unsafe to dive with them because the mothers are very protective when they're really, really small and they'll bite you. The moms will come in and bite you and they're huge. But once they get to be like adolescents, the moms are still hanging around watching the whole thing, but the pups are so playful and they're so interactive. And so they'll come up to you and they'll like nibble on your hair or they'll nibble on your snorkel, even though, you know, as a diver, you're supposed to wear that even though you're in the water. It, it was, I, I want to go back and do that again. That was probably, yeah, definitely one of my favorite dives ever. You are a certified badass. And, <laughs> uh, and, and on top of being a badass, you're also an author of a memoir called Resurfacing Sisterhood Sharks and Storms. I want to ask you, why did you choose to write this memoir? So I've been a writer my whole life. I was an English major. I graduated from Boston College and immediately went into advertising. I started writing. I was a copywriter at an ad agency in Boston. And then for many years, I freelanced and then I started writing for magazines and, you know, always in the back of my mind was this drumbeat of write a book, write a book, write a book, just like diving. You know, that was always kind of back there, too. And then, you know, I started so many books over the years and I just never felt excited enough about the material, I think. And when all these things in my life transpired in a short period of time. You know, my kids left the nest. I started diving. Really good friend of mine got very sick with cancer. That's a big part of the book, as you know. That's the sisterhood part. I just felt like I, I had, I just had this urge to, to write about it. And my close friends who were witnessing all this around me were saying, like, "This is your book. You got to write this book." And when I sat down to write it, it just kind of all spilled out. It just didn't feel as difficult as the other books I tried to write. Having said that, now that I've done it. 
I, you know, I'm going to write another one. I'm going to write a fiction book. So I think just like the diving thing, there's a parallel there because once you start diving, you know, you just want to keep doing it. You mm-hmm. just, you're just, most people anyway are. Yeah. You, you it's, know, addictive. it's addictive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's two excerpts from the book that I want to quickly go over and, you know, get your thoughts on. But I do want to say one of the reasons that I was drawn to you when I heard about or read about your story is that you started diving at 49. And I think a lot of people, even our age, think that it's too late for them. So Mm. being, you know, middle age, I can only assume that this is going to inspire other individuals to go out there and try it once they see your videos and hear this content. But thank you for being a guest because I'm sure it's going to be beneficial for a lot of people. I sure hope so. Even if it doesn't inspire them to go diving, maybe it inspires them to fulfill another lifelong dream that they've had and to realize that, you know, life isn't over. I mean, I, these are, I feel like these years have been probably the best years of my life. And I think when you embrace your dreams at any age, it just inspires you to, to, to keep going and expand more. And, you know, the life expectancy is so much longer now. We have so many more years to live and live well with good, you know, medical care and prevent, you know, good habits like eating well and exercise, which I've always done. You can live and live healthily for so many more years and really enjoy, you know, your your later years. So I really hope it does inspire people to do that. Do you know of anyone who you have inspired through your book to take it up or in your life? Or even like you said, inspired to do something new. Well, it's funny you asked that question because just yesterday we had lunch with old friends and the woman had just read my book and she has decided to go down to Key Largo and dive with her dad's friend. And this guy, I think is like 75 and is wow. still diving and is going to show her how to do it. She's almost 70. So I think that's one person anyway that I think read it and kind of thought, well, I've always wanted to do it. Laura did it. You know, let's try it out. So I mean, it's fascinating to me how how like a little push can, you know, really inspire people to do something or just a friend who's encouraging them to do it can be that one push, a book, you know, a conversation. So, yeah, that's really cool. And something that you said right now is that these have been the best years of your life. And this ties into the first excerpt I want to bring up. In your book, you talk about being on the beach and metaphorically cutting the umbilical cord with your children. And, you know, now as a, as a 30 year old without children, I can only empathize with you. But as the son of two loving parents who watch their son leave the nest twice, once to go to college and then once to leave California and move to Austin, Texas, I can remember the pain they exhibited both times. And can you speak about that experience and what it was like for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I was a really, really involved mom. My my husband worked crazy hours. We decided early on in our marriage that I would stay home and freelance and he would be the main breadwinner. And so, you know, I think in order to do that, like realistically, in order for you to be in a one, you know, income earner house, that person most likely has to kill themselves, basically, to put in so many hours to earn enough money to support the family. And so I sometimes felt like a single parent, you know, I, I, he was working really, really late hours at night. I almost always put the kids to bed by myself. I was the one on the sidelines at the sports. So it was like my whole identity and my daughter, my middle daughter, my middle child went off to college. And the same year she went off to college, my son was, my youngest was going to enter high school. And he just begged us to go away to boarding school. And the other two had not done that. I really didn't want him to go. I fought him hard on it but he's very persuasive. And, you know, he eventually found a school that he convinced us to go look at. And we, you know, we live in Massachusetts, we went up to New Hampshire, and we looked at the school and we had to agree it was like the perfect fit for him. So we relented. And I don't regret it, because it was the right decision for him. But I, when those kids went off that fall, I just fell off a cliff. I I was lost. I, I just didn't know what to do with myself. I was heartbroken. And, you know, fortunately, that was the year that Buffy got me to go diving. And so that helped me resurface into my own life, which is, of course, the title of the book. But yeah, it, it's hard. I think I think our generation of parents was so much more involved with their kids than our parents were. 
in some ways it was good. Some ways I think it was unhealthy. I don't think I was a helicopter parent, but I was, you know, super engaged. And, and also, frankly, I really liked my children. I didn't just love them. And I still do. I liked them as people. So they were really good company. And my youngest son is absolutely hysterical. He's super creative. Like he was just my buddy, you know, he was pretty easy to raise and I just missed him to death. So it was, it was hard. It was really, really hard, but you know, like anything in life, sometimes the hard things lead to the best things, right? So it's the yin and the yang. Yeah, definitely. I love that word helicopter parent (laughs) because it's, it's kind of like a, it's a newer word, but yeah, no, that that's really great. And I love how you it might seem like a small thing to some people, just taking up a new hobby or a new thing. But I think scuba diving is so interesting in that you can't help but literally be completely immersed in it because that time in the water, you are in the water. There is no, first of all, you can't talk to people. You can only use hand signals. You can really only be there. And so as far as sports go, I mean, I don't know that you can get more immersive and and no pun intended, you know? (laughs) Yeah, that's a really good point. It's so meditative, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. It's like you're in a cocoon. It's just the coolest thing. Yeah, it's awesome. And talking about being present, it brings us up to this second excerpt from your book. And quite honestly, my favorite, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. The midday bohemian sun has warmed the shallow water to bathtub temperature. Waiting in, I take a deep breath and slowly exhale. For the first time in years, I feel fully present in this very moment. I am not brushing my teeth while at the same time figuring out the afternoon carpool. I am not walking the dogs while making a mental grocery list. I am not chucking in a load of wash while worrying about Tucker's recent math test. I am here now. And the reason that I love that so much is because I think many of us or most of us are constantly juggling through multiple tasks in any given day. And that we rarely give ourselves the opportunity to breathe, relax, and reflect, and just feel alive. And so that part really stuck out for me. Yeah, I I love that part too. I some of that, quite honestly, it was due to the fact that I, we were in the Bahamas mm. without great cell service, without great Wi-Fi, with mm. you know, without some of the modern conveniences that we're used to in the states. Very little shopping. You know, there's, you, it's not like you can just, and you can't shop on Amazon because there's no delivery there. I mean, there is, but <laughs> it's super complicated to do it. It's super yeah. expensive and complicated. So it's not that you can't, but it's really hard. And you bring up a good point that some of the best diving places are quite remote. I mean, I, I've mentioned this in a couple episodes, but I dove extensively on Koh Tao in Thailand, which is actually known for diving and really great diving shops, like five-star rated that are, you know, also very affordable compared to Western standards. And yeah, it was remote. I mean, we lived down a dirt road for a few months, you know, in a little hut by the, by the water. And in fact, I lost my phone or I got my phone stolen two months into the trip and never replaced it two years, a two year trip. And I was just thinking about that. Like, I can't believe I did that. This was in 2015. I don't know that you could manage that today. But yeah, anyway, you bring up a really great point in that it it gets you to these places and also gets you to fall in love with them in a deeper way than just this is a paradise retreat. It's like you're getting to know it so intimately that you're going to the bottom of the ocean, essentially. So yeah, I love that. And so Laura, if our listeners want to know a little bit more about you or where to follow you, where can they find you? So I'm pretty active on Instagram, which is Laura underscore N underscore DeSisto. But, you know, through my website, you can, there's a spot right away where you can enter the website and put in your email to get onto my mailing list for future books or whatever. And then they can email me directly at Laura at LauraDeSisto.com. Sounds good. So that was Laura underscore N underscore desisto, D-E-S-I-S-T-O, yeah. in case anyone wants to follow her adventures. And my book is on is on Amazon. You can just put in resurfacing desisto. If you just put in resurfacing, what comes up is a lot of facial creams. <laughs> 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 and I wish I'd known that before I titled the book. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I know. 
All right. Well, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. I think this is a great place to end. So you can find us at Globetrotters Podcast on Instagram. GTSpodcast.com is our website. You can find us also on Facebook at Globetrotters Podcast and Twitter at Globetrotpod. And we'd love to hear from you. Did you like this episode? Do you have any questions about scuba diving? Please reach out to us. We are so more than happy to help. And we'd love to hear from you. Editing on this podcast was done by Saskia Hedvani, music by Thin Blue Collective. You can find their music on Bandcamp and Spotify. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.